Rediscover God's Word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. This is Real Bible Study with teacher Tom Bradford. Welcome to Torah Class. Well, welcome to our introduction to the book of Joel. Now, I strongly, underline strongly, recommend that if you have not first studied Hosea and Amos and Jonah in that order, that you just stop. All right, and, and do that, or you're just not going to get the most out of Joel. In the second chapter of Joel, we read this. Tear your heart, not your garments. Turn to Adonai your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in grace, willing to change his mind about disaster. Who knows? He may turn. He may change his mind and leave a blessing behind, enough for grain offerings and drink offerings to present to Adonai your God. As we continue in our studies of the 12 books that form what is called the Minor Prophets, and minor simply means the length of those 12 books are rather short when compared to those other prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah. I have grouped together Hosea and Amos, Jonah and now Joel for teaching purposes because they all propel us towards a common theme and governing dynamic of God that I call if-then. That is, in Yehovah's dealings and relationships with humanity, he operates nearly exclusively on a conditional basis. What do I mean by that? Conditional means that God typically responds to the behavior of humans by reacting accordingly. God created human beings with something we call free will. And while there is much theological and philosophical debate over exactly what free will is and to what extent our free will is actually free, nonetheless, humans have been given the ability to make choices. If then reflects that ability for us to make choices, just as God has the ability to make choices. Now, human choices come in two basic categories, morals and preferences. God has given us his code of morality that carefully lays down the structure and the boundaries of morality, what is evil, what is good. The first code was actually put within us as part of our DNA. And it goes by various names, with the most recognizable being natural law. That is, all humans have naturally built into us a general sense that there exists as such a thing as morality, good versus evil, and what is universally understood as the definition of good behavior versus bad behavior. The second code, the law of Moses, took that intrinsically human natural law and wrote it out in much more detail, but changing none of its principles. This second code was initiated with the Ten Commandments, and then immediately followed by approximately 600 more laws, I call them case laws, each based upon one or another of those Ten Commandments. Now, choices based on preference, on the other hand, have nothing to do with morality. No moral stigma is attached to preferences. 
God has never set down a code of preferences. However, by setting down a code of morality, we have divinely defined for us which of our free will choices belong in the moral category, which belong as in the preference category. And whether we prefer chocolate over vanilla, big cars to small cars, baseball to football, city living to rural living, and this and infinitely more, these are choices we can make that have no divine consequence because they're not about morality. However, moral choices do have divine consequences. Therefore, it can be said as a proverb that the governing dynamic of if-then applies only to our moral choices. I'm going to try to make this easier to understand in a practical, more applicable way. Obedience to God's moral code causes God to react in a positive way toward us in his blessings, and disobedience causes him to react in a negative way towards us, his curses. His moral code together with his reaction towards our response to that equals his justice system. Now, what makes God's justice system so wonderful and unique is that he adds to it the element of mercy. That is, God's justice system is not simply a mechanical, rigid, legalistic system of do's and don'ts with consequences for us written in stone. Now, while our wrong behavior might well warrant a negative response from him, he will, at his sole discretion, at times give us mercy so that we do not suffer what we rightly deserve. Now, while it's not always so, when we recognize our bad behavior, bad behavior the Bible calls sin, and we repent of it, we offer God our sorrow as well as a changed behavior to the good, this tends to trigger God's mercy upon us. Even so, sometimes His mercy comes before repentance. Other times, he does not give us mercy, even with our repentance. Now, what I just said <laughs> greatly bothers much Christian doctrine on the matter of repentance and mercy, as well as fundamentally what's moral and what is not and who decides. Now, while not necessarily universal, Christian doctrine broadly states that when we come to trust in Yeshua, in Jesus Christ, all of this conditionality, all of this if-then ends, and God's response towards our behavior becomes unconditional. That is, only mercy is shown and it's guaranteed, no matter what. And then while that is a pleasant fiction, it is still fiction. The Bible in no way says such a thing. But rather, this is a created doctrine that came about later in Constantinian Christianity sometime after its inception in Rome in the 4th century. Now, it seems, however, that in more ancient times, the 8th century BC and earlier, among the Israelites, there evolved a similar belief that because Jehovah was Israel's God, and because Israel was God's chosen and set-apart people, that they too had something near to an unconditional promise of mercy for their bad behavior. That is, God would always accept whatever their offer was as repentance, and therefore they bore, it bore no negative consequences, and even 
if their repentance was slow to come or not particularly sincere, God still would withhold his wrath upon them. Just as Christian doctrine has it wrong on the subject, so did Israel, and boy, it cost them dearly. Hosea, Amos, Jonah, and now Joel seemed to be God's vehicle to communicate to Israel and to us in order to correct this dangerous misperception that gives us a false sense of security. And after Israel split into two separate kingdoms in the mid-10th century B.C., they split into the kingdoms of Judah and to Ephraim Israel. Ephraim Israel felt so certain of this doctrine of God never offering anything but his mercy that they felt free enough to create new worship practices, new rituals, new societal rules that were far more pagan in nature than reflective of their Torah-based scriptural faith from the time of Moses. Now, Christianity has mirrored this mindset. And it shows up especially in solidifying the idea that God will show Jesus' followers only mercy with the once saved, always saved doctrine. This erroneous doctrine essentially completely removes our behavior, even our thoughts, from having any tangible effect on our relationship with God, thereby assuring a good and peaceful relationship with Him regardless of anything evil that we could think or do. Again, this flies in the face of all biblical principles as found in both the Old and the New Testaments. Now, God used these four minor prophets that we have studied or are about to study to correct this theological error, an error that came from man-made doctrines. Listen again to Joel 2, verse 14. Who knows? He may turn, change his mind, and leave a blessing behind, enough for grain offerings and drink offerings to present to Adonai your God. Almost the same words were used in the book of Jonah in order to make the same point. In Jonah 3.9, he says, who knows? Maybe God will change his mind, relent, and turn from his fierce anger, and we won't perish. So did this dynamic of if-then change? after the time of Yeshua? Did the conditional change to the unconditional? Not according to Paul, Romans 9, 18. So then God has mercy on whom he wants and he hardens whom he wants. See, the bottom line is that while Joel is nearly always used to speak about an apocalyptic end time scenario, especially in the last 50 years or so, repentance and how God responds to us is equally present in what Joel teaches. If then has, since Adam, been at the heart of how God deals with mankind. And, and is this part that can really hurt our heads. There is no ironclad guarantee of mercy. There are always conditions. And only God knows for certain when mercy will be offered and when it won't. Now, don't misunderstand me. Maintaining a sincere trust in Yeshua demonstrated in our fruit, our good works and deeds is the path to an eternal relationship of good with God. No question. However, it is not based on a momentary or a short-lived experience with God, or a promise to God, such as saying the sinner's prayer, then it quickly fades to black for the remainder, remainder of our lives. We all continue to live under, if then, divine governing principle, because, saved or not, we all continue to have free will. 
And God also continues to make choices concerning us based on his perfect knowledge and justice. Now, the book of Joel contains fewer than 1,000 words. In the Greek Septuagint, therefore in most English Bibles, Joel consists of only three chapters. Okay. However, the Hebrew Masoretic text, such as used by the complete Jewish Bible, Joel consists of four chapters. Now, the contents are the same either way. So don't worry whether your Bible uses three or four chapters. I'll be operating for four chapters. So when I quote chapter and verse numbers, it might be different in your Bible. Now, we know of nothing of Joel's life. Okay, only that he is the son of someone called Pethuel, of whom we also know nothing. Now, for many centuries, some rabbis have decided that Pethuel is an alternative, alternative spelling for Shmuel, Samuel, and therefore Joel was the prophet Samuel's son. This holds no water at all. It's just a fanciful imagining. Some ancient Jewish legends attach him to the tribe of Reuben. Again, there is no evidence for this. So we know little more about Joel than that he lived and that he prophesied and con concerning primarily Judah and that he was a prophet of God. Now, one of the great debates about Joel is when he lived and prophesied. Okay. This debate tends to fall into one of two camps, pre or post exilic. That is before the Babylonian exile of Judah or after their return to the land from their exile. Modern scholarship leans toward it being written after the return of the Judean exiles, while older scholarship places it before. The reason for the difference is primarily that modern scholarship tends to give a lot of weight to supposed literary patterns and, and vocabulary found in the text that can identify when a document was written. There is, of course, no way to prove or disprove this method of dating ancient literature. It's subjective, it's theoretical, and it is decided only by a consensus of language scholars. Now, biblical scholars, Jewish and Christian, up until the early 20th century, generally dated Joel to the same time frame as Hosea and Amos and Jonah, the 8th and 9th centuries BC. Some date Joel as the earliest of these four, others as the latest of these four. And as some of the proof of this being the general era, it is offered that essentially a few identical words and passages are used among these four books. The only real debate here is who influenced whom. That is, did Joel write first and these other books borrowed from him? Or was it Amos that wrote first and Joel and others borrowed from him? And so on and so on. Now, I'm not going to offer an opinion because nothing about this is settled. However, I think there is little reason to deviate from what the earlier scholars agree on in that Joel lived and prophesied sometime between the late 9th and late 8th century BC. Big time frame, but that's about the best we can do. Now for me, this obvious if then theme of Joel is the giveaway as to when it was written. Because we know that during this time period of God's prophets, they were trying to drag Israel away from a false doctrine that had arisen. That God had obligated himself to always show love and mercy towards Israel regardless of their behavior and equally always show hate and wrath towards 
Israel's Gentile enemies simply because they were Gentiles and political enemies of Israel. Now, from a panoramic viewpoint, Joel consists of two halves. The first half talks about Judah's distress and the suffering it's undergoing because of God's wrath upon them. The second half of the book describes deliverance from these woes. But it's a future deliverance. And by its nature, this deliverance is non-specific in time frame, but also has the tone of setting something well into the future from the day of Joel. Therefore, exactly when this book was written isn't all that important. Okay, It especially isn't all that important because of the end times apocalypse and then restoration that's being prophesied. One that Jews and, Gen uh, Jews and Christians generally agree is still to future to us today. Now, something we have to pay special attention to is that like with all the biblical prophets, and especially within this group of four, these four minor prophets that we've been studying recently, the message, the oracles from God revolve around the covenant of Moses and particularly its curses. And when we hold Deuteronomy 32 side by side with Joel 1, 1 through 2, 17, we see this connection that is very parallel. And I draw this out because late 20th century and early 21st century Christian Bible scholarship wants to distance themselves from this Torah connection. The earliest church scholar who professed such a view, at least the earliest I could find, was the known anti-Semitic Martin Luther. He stated that God moving away from the Torah in Joel was in preparation for the coming of Christ when a whole new justice dynamic would come about. Hans Walter Wolf, another German Bible scholar, writes this that well sums up Luther's and the modern Christian scholar's attitude about Joel. He says this, Joel can hardly belong to the circles that take their stand upon the canonized Torah and see it, see it in liturgical compliance with it, the ultimate will of the God of Israel. Instead, one has the impression that he belongs to those eschatological groups who are still expecting completely new acts of Yahweh. Let me untangle that. In other words, Wolf is saying that Joel is part of a group of prophets that is separating themselves from the Torah and is expecting God to do something new and different. This would be a pretty startling statement from anyone. However, it very much reflects a troubling modern viewpoint of Bible academics. Now, where is he drawing this conclusion from? Well, it begins with the idea of Darby's dispensational doctrine that has history divided up into eras, with God changing things, sort of like evolution, as we go along. And this changing includes what his justice system looks like. Now that plays well into the fundamental church doctrine that God abolished the Torah for something new. Now, frankly, we see this doctrine of the New Testament succeeding and replacing the Old Testament being spun in a hundred inventive ways as time moves on. Today, the spin infected, has infected the Christian faith so thoroughly that even some of the Gospels are now being held suspect and therefore being discounted, especially Matthews. Because when being intellectually honest about it, there are things in the Gospels that are said by Yeshua that dis, they just don't jibe with some embedded Christian doctrines. Therefore, just as the Old Testament was some time ago, 
deemed irrelevant by the church, there is now a subtle, but there is a growing movement to put the synoptic gospels into a lesser category, relying more on Paul's epistles for clarity. Again, this concept of Joel moving away from the idea of God responding to Israel's behavior based upon the covenant of Moses is quite new, but it's also very agenda driven. Rather, as is self evident from Hosea and Amos and Jonah, and now here in Joel, Israel's behavior based upon their obedience to the covenant of Moses is the criteria for how God is judging them. In Joel, Israel's, mainly Judah's, disobedient behavior is causing these covenant curses to fall upon them. Otherwise, if this didn't happen, God would hardly be a just God. I mean, if God did not react to evil, how can that be called justice? Not only that, if God's wrath upon Israel was not based on the covenant of Moses, then on what other known standard was it being based? Having no standard would make God arbitrary and capricious. And judging on some subjective standard Israel doesn't even know about. And this notion is, of course, exactly how Christianity bases its doctrines. God's justice is now seen as a subjective and evolving standard. With each person having virtually their own customized moral code according to what the Holy Spirit tells each person is right and wrong for them. Now, what we need to watch for in Joel is his primary theme, which is the day of the Lord. Now, I wanted you to be acutely aware that even the phrase, the day of the Lord, which is standard in end times doctrines and in most English Bibles, in fact, that is not accurate. The phrase used throughout Joel is actually the day of Yehovah. Joel goes into more detail than any other Old Testament source as to exactly what the day of Yehovah is. And we're gonna delve into that more as it appears in each chapter of Joel. However, I'll say this about that for the moment. The best understanding of the day of Yehovah is in its connection to holy war. It begins with an ancient Middle Eastern cultural thought that a great sovereign could win any battle of conquest in a single day. And while in reality a single day victory is a hyperbolic fiction, it is meant to express the supreme unmatchable power of a great king. So in Joel, as in other Bible prophets, the day of Jehovah pictures God in the role of a great divine warrior king, fighting a holy war and winning overwhelmingly. Biblically, any war that God involves himself in is by definition a holy war. And any war he does not involve himself in is not. Knowing this, it's important to notice that there are a number of Day of Jehovah, Day of the Lord, events in the Bible. Some involve Israel, some involve the Gentile nations, some are in the past, some are in the future. So while there are, of course, similarities, perhaps a level of prefiguration of the great end times day of Jehovah in comparison to these other and early ones, let's not take it too far. 
Or should we look at all the earlier events as but veiled references to the end times one? So with that, please open your Bibles to Joel chapter 1. Joel chapter 1. Joel chapter 1, starting with verse 1. The word of Adonai that came to you, well, Joel, the son of Petuel. Hear this, you leaders. Listen to all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in your ancestors' days? Tell your children about it and have them tell it to theirs. And have them tell the next generation. What the cutter worms left, the locusts ate. What the locusts left, the grasshoppers ate. What the grasshoppers left, the shearer worms ate. Wake up, drunkards, and weep. Wail, all of you who drink wine, because the juice of the grape will be withheld from your mouth, for a mighty and numberless nation has invaded my land. His teeth are lion's teeth. His fangs are those of a lioness. He has reduced my vines to waste, my fig trees to splinters. He plucked them bare, stripped their bark, and left their branches white. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Grain offering and drink offering are cut off from the house of Adonai. The Kohanim, the priests, are mourning, those who are serving Adonai. The fields are ruined. The ground is grieving, for the grain is ruined and the new wine is dried up. The olive oil is wretched. Despair, you farmers. Lament, vine dressers, over the wheat and the barley. The harvest from the fields is lost. The vines have withered, the fig trees wilted, also the pomegranate, date palm, and apple tree. All the trees in the fields have withered, and the people's joy has withered away. Kohanim. Put on sackcloth and weep. Wail, you who serve the, the altar. Come, lie in sackcloth all night long, you who serve my God. For the grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Proclaim a holy fast. Call for a solemn assembly. Gather the leaders and all who live in the land to the house of Adonai your God and cry out to Adonai. Oh no, the day. The day of Adonai is upon us. As destruction coming from Shaddai, it is coming. The food is cut off before our very eyes. Also joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed grain is rotting in its furrows. The granaries are deserted. The barns are in ruins because the grain is withered. How the animals groan. The herds of cattle are perplexed. They have no pasture. The flocks of sheep here bear the punishment too. Adonai, I cry out to you, for the fire has consumed the pastures in the desert, and the flames set ablaze all the trees in the fields. Even the wild animals come to you panting, because the stream beds have dried up, and fire has consumed the pastures in the desert. Well, as with Hosea and, and Jonah, Joel opens up with the phrase, the word of Jehovah came. Now, what I taught in those books about this opening is, therefore, also appropriate for Joel. It is that the word is not referring to speech. It is referring to a named entity of God. The word is the name of a spiritual entity, a manifestation of God, just as is the Holy Spirit. So it was through a visitation of the Word that Joel got his information. Now, the book of Joel lends itself to much preaching and application. So while we will, as always, focus mostly on a word-by-word -word exegesis of Joel, it's unavoidable that we shall also delve into how this applies to us. 
very personally as individuals, as part of a corporate body of believers, as citizens of whatever nation we belong to, but also as part of a global community. The first people that Joel is to address are Israel's national leaders. And the oracle begins with the word that the leaders are to Shema. They are to listen and they are to obey. This powerful word, Shema, is essentially like a summons in which those who are summoned are there to receive an instruction to do something. Now, to simply listen to the words of the summons and then not obey it is to make a conscious choice to disobey. This is because since one hears the decree, they cannot plead ignorance if they don't do what is commanded. They cannot say, but I didn't know. So this is a call to action, not just a call to gain knowledge. Then to everyone else in the land, we are told that they are to listen. Now, while azan, listen, technically does not carry the weight that Shema does, as used here, this is not meant that the elders are to listen and do, but everyone else is just to listen and remain passive. Rather, this is used in a poetic way, as prophecies typically do. That is, azan is here meant to be parallel with Shema, and in this context, the land means Judah. So the idea is that everyone in Judah, without exception, is to hear what God says through Joel and to obey it. Now, next is a series of words intended to say that everyone should pay attention because the event being spoken of has never happened before. Now, while this may be an exaggeration, nonetheless, the point is that the event is enormous and it's devastating in Israel's history. Even in the lifetimes of Judah's ancestors, such a thing has not happened to such an intensity. Verse 3 continues with the hyperbole by saying this event is so unparalleled that those who live through it are to tell their children about it, and those children are to tell their own children about it. This event is explained in dramatic fashion, beginning in verse 4. It describes a succession of attacks of swarms of locusts that devour every green growing plant in Judah. And when in verse 3, the people of Judah are ordered to tell this story to every future generation because of its great meaning to the nation of Israel, it harkens back to things of the past in the Torah. So there are, there are just numerous places in the Torah and in other Old Testament teachings with the same kind of thought of passing down to the generations a witness to a momentous event that was caused by the God of Israel. Now, why is it so important to remember it? Because those who disregard the lessons of history are bound to repeat the same mistakes. The same thought is expressed much earlier in the Bible. In Deuteronomy 32, 7, it says, remember how the days of old were Think of the years through all the ages. Ask your father. He'll tell you. Your leaders too. They'll inform you. Exodus 20, 12, 26. When your children ask you, what do you mean by this ceremony? Psalm 78, 3 through 7. The things we have heard and known and which our fathers told us, we will not hide from their descendants. We will tell the generation to come the praises of Adonai and his strength and the wonders that he has performed. He raised up a testimony in Jacob and established a Torah in Israel. He, he commanded our ancestors to make this known to their children 
so that the next generation would know it. The children not yet born, who themselves arise and tell their own children, who could then put their confidence in God, not forgetting God's deeds, but obeying his commandments. And when adding back in the original Hebrew, verse 4 says this about the invasion of these voracious insects. It says, what the Gazam left, the Arbe ate. What the Arbe left, the Yelech ate. And what the Yelech left, the Chasil ate. We find four different words describing these ravaging bugs. So what do the four different words indicate? Now, over the centuries, Bible academics have attempted to identify the terms used here to describe the particulars of those eating insects. Some say they are about four different species. Others say they are four stages of locust development from infant to adult. Entomologists, however, say there are six, not four, stages of locust development. Now, the Talmud uses 20 or more words for locusts. <laughs> so the bottom line is that nearly for certain, what's happening is not an insect biology lesson from Joel. Okay. Rather, it is a most dramatic way to say that a series of four swarms of locusts invaded Judah one after the next, leaving absolutely nothing behind. Now, in reality, reality, locusts are just grasshoppers, regardless of the many different words used for them. And when their eggs hatch under ideal, occasional ideal conditions, these swarms are almost beyond what we can imagine. They can be miles and miles across. The worst part of a locust plague is not only that they are sudden and unstoppable, but that they affect people and animals and from more than one planting season. Here in Joel, the description is such that even that portion of a crop that might be used for seed the next year is eaten up. So famine is sure to follow for more than one year. Biblically, in some ways, a locust invasion is considered worse than an invasion by enemy forces. So there's little above a locust plague to describe utter, complete devastation and the consequent suffering of people and livestock and even of wild animals. But is this a literal grasshopper infestation? Or is this a metaphor for an attack by an enemy army? Now, the academic community, Jewish and Christian, is pretty evenly divided on this. There are a few places in the Bible where a locust invasion is clearly a metaphor for an invasion by an army. On the other hand, as in, say, Exodus 10, a locust plague is fairly literal. That said, in the biblical accounts comparing locusts to human armies, it is made clear that this comparison is what's happening. That is, locusts are not symbols of something else. It's that their characteristics can be used to dramatically describe the effects of an invasion of enemy forces. But here in Joel, it's not the case. This is not used as a comparison. It's not a metaphorical description. Neither is in Egyptian or in Assyrian records are locusts used as symbols of enemy armies. So it is my belief that in Joel, this particular locust invasion is just that, an invasion of grasshoppers. Now, starting in verse 5, begins an appeal for lamentation concerning the gravity of the devastation that has fallen upon Judah. 
What is lamentation? It is a passionate expression of grief and of sorrow. Now, what we read here is actually a rather classic Hebrew approach to the offering of prayers of lamentation that were usual and customary, not just in the Bible, but throughout the Middle East of that era. Typically, a national proclamation was issued that would summon the people to a ceremony when a national emergency of some sort erupted. Thus, there is usually this emergency had to do with an invasion by a foreign entity, or maybe the food supply was an issue. Thus, there is a recognizable form of a literary structure that was common and it was standard for these calls. Usually, the king would be the one who instigated it. Then the elders would see to it that the word spread to the people at large. So Joel, he's just the latest example of this call to lamentation. It's not at all unique, nothing about it. But you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if in modern times, at the moment of national distress or looming catastrophe that we had leaders that sincerely instructed the people to come together and pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for his mercy, for his help. Sadly, about the closest we get today is but carefully crafted, politically correct words that call for a moment of silence or to pray to our personal God, should we even believe in a God, whomever that might be. And I can promise you, such a call is not only meaningless and ineffective, but it's actually offensive to Yehovah. And because this is the case, as believers in the God of Israel, we ought not allow such a thing to ever go unchallenged. Knowing who we are praying to is everything. Praying to anyone other than Yehovah is idolatry. And we need to say it out loud. We need to quit worrying if we might offend someone. This fearful silence has been displayed for far too long. And what we see happening to our crumbling society is the result of not standing up for the truth. Well, essentially then, Verse 4 announced the cause of the, of the trage, tragedy, locusts. And then verse 5 begins a long response of lamentation to that tragedy. Now, it might seem odd, I think it's pretty odd, that the first people called to lament are drunks. However, I think the point of it is that in many ways, they represent the mindless unawareness of Judah's citizens in general about what's going on and why. A drunk has only one thought, acquiring more drink. They have an attitude of complete carelessness. Whatever happens outside of their tiny little sphere of living life intoxicated in order to avoid real life simply does not concern them. This was Judah in general. They may not all have been intoxicated with alcohol, but they were intoxicated with obtaining as many comforts of life as they could possibly get, accompanied with a willingness to water down their biblical faith to obtain peace and security with their pagan neighbors, and also to involve any internal conflicts among their countrymen. Now, how does what I just said resonate with you? Does that not well describe the Western world in general, and so much of the modern day church? 
we are so absorbed into our daily lives of gaining material possessions, going about our business, carping about the latest disruption to our personal plans, griping because we have to work too hard at our jobs, we don't have enough leisure time, that we put God on the shelf for all but an hour or two on Saturday or Sunday. And like Joel's drunkards, an entire new church doctrine has arisen called the prosperity doctrine that seeks to make our intoxication, our addiction with wealth and material pleasures as though it is something the Lord desires for us. In fact, the more addicted we are to it and the more we obtain from it is actually God showing us his favor and pleasure for our supposed great faith. So just as the drunkards in Joel are representative of Judah and their casual attitudes towards God, so is the prosperity doctrine representative of the casual attitude of too many believers towards God. And we need to think long and hard about this and see if this might apply to us individually. Well, what are the drunkards to wail and weep about? Their wine supply is about to dry up. See, this sudden invasion of locusts has disrupted Judah's and especially Jerusalem's complacent way of life. The locusts are God's wake-up call. And what is happening is out of the control of the people or their leaders because it's God's judgment on them. See, we must not look at this and think, well, locust infestations happen from time to time, so let's not make too much out of this. See, the thing we learned in studying the Torah is that God will use the, the natural as opposed to the supernatural to deal with humanity. It's just that when God ordains it as a judgment, the intensity of it is far greater than normally happens in nature, and it also demonstrates God's control over all nature, that he can command it to action at his will and at his timing. See, I, I cannot help but feel that the COVID pandemic that the world faced was the locust plague only in modern terms. We have had pandemics before, but rarely as intense and rapidly globally felt as COVID. See, this pandemic has exposed the weaknesses and vulnerability of human society everywhere. Little has changed the world so universally, so permanently, in such a short time as COVID. Now, what, we, what ought to be another clue for us that this was anything but a natural occurrence that happened accidentally or on its own is that to this day, medical science still cannot agree on its source. Freedoms and prosperities so much of the world was enjoying based on increasing technology, expected entitlement to not only basic living, but also fun and convenient things was virtually curtailed overnight. Things we felt we could count on without the least thought or concern, even toilet paper, suddenly became scarce, if not unobtainable. Our freedoms, even to gather together for communal worship, were taken away from us. We tend to want to blame chance, bad luck, maybe an incompetent, perhaps authoritarian government intervention for it. But might it actually have been God's wake-up call to us all? Just like the locusts were for Judah a slumbering people, many of whom claim a faith in him, 
but actually display little of it. See, in many ways, such a thought goes against a, a typical Christian belief that God would never cause calamity or evil to befall us. But in fact, the Bible teaches the opposite. And the reality is that our faith in Yeshua does not immunize us from it. I tell you frankly, I do believe that COVID was and is God's judgment and that he directed it. Absolutely. I mean, I can't say with 100% certainty, but I do know what God's word teaches us. And I think an honest assessment of the world as it is and of those who currently claim allegiance to him, but whose life and desires demonstrate something quite different, it can be nothing else. God wants we, the intoxicated, to arise from our coma-like spiritual sleep. So let us respond accordingly. Let us respond. Let us respond with lamentation, with prayer, but mostly with a renewed devotion to God and to active obedience to his commandments. Okay, we'll continue with Joel next time. For more teachings of real Bible study and to rediscover God's word with Tom Bradford, visit Torah Class today on the web, streaming TV, or download the Torah Class mobile app.